All right, we'll just get. Um, oh, 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 shoot. Yeah, that's right. I forgot to turn off the narrations. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So this, this module is, is about um, molecular and particle separations. So like I said, I think a lot of you will find, uh, find this interesting because this module actually gets into analytical chemistry and what these chips are actually used for. Okay, and two of the most common things that, that lab on a chip systems are used for is uh, for molecular and particle separation. And like I said, the first time I learned about some of these techniques when I was in grad school. I found them very interesting from an engineering standpoint because the, the uh, um, you know, some of them use, utilize electric fields. For example, electrophoresis is based on electric fields and I'm an electrical engineer by training. And um, uh, you can see how engineered devices are actually being used for various types of analyses. You know, we're, as engineers, we're instrument makers, right? So uh, these, uh, these techniques, that engineers have come up with and the systems that are being used here, uh, these are the basis for a lot of the commercial uh, biotech devices that are currently sold on the market. Um, so I, I think you'll find them interesting from an uh, engineering standpoint. This slide shows uh, why uh, separations are important. This is just a very, 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 very narrow cross-section of the, you know the field of chemical separations is huge field. Okay, chemists spend their entire careers on it. Uh, they're used throughout you know forensics, pharmaceuticals, life sciences, and what have you. This is just one example. Okay, of why chemical separations might be important. So consider blood analysis because this is what we we started talking about at the uh, beginning of the the class uh, class sessions. So blood is a mixture of uh, a whole bunch of solid particles, and the solid particles are things like red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, um, different types of uh, other cell types that you might find in your blood. So there's a bunch of particulates in there, and that's referred to as you know hematocrit. If you're your doctors, um, you might have a hematocrit count when you do a blood test. You know that's sort of you know gauging how much of how much of your blood has is made up of these solid uh, particles. And when we want to analyze the solid particles, we often want to count the number of each type of particle. For example, you might want to do a red blood cell count, a platelet count, a white blood cell count. For AIDS diagnostics, they're looking for a count of a certain type of cell. CD4 counts for AIDS, are used for AIDS diagnostics. Okay. So um, separations are important because, first of all, you want to separate these particles out from the, the rest of the liquid sample. And then ultimately you want to separate, you want to be able to separate these particles by their size. You know, the red blood cells will have a different size than white blood cells. Or you might want to separate them by other things like um, their charge, their shape, or, you know, their biochemical affinities to uh, certain things. Like, for example, um, you can actually uh, count, numbers, count the numbers of cells that, have, uh, that are expressing a certain protein. And so you can separate... Um, these particles by their, not just their physical characteristics, but also their biochemical functionalities. So, uh, uh, you know, once we separate out the particles, in, uh, from, we also have this clear liquid, too. You know, besides the, uh, have any of you seen this before? Have you seen, like, this type of, uh, if you take blood and you put it in a centrifuge, the centrifuge basically spins uh, it spins these tubes. These tubes are kind of going around radially. The centrifugal force causes the the heavier particles to kind of sediment to the bottom like this, and the lighter stuff is on top here. So this is a, this is one way to do a separation. A separation between the solid particles and um, the the lighter particles. By the way, for those of you who saw a few confused glances, so I'm just. Um, Draw it out like this. A centrifuge is you imagine that you have something that is rotating like this, and within this rotating system, your test tube would would sit like this. 
So the test tubes are basically going around in a circle. They're being spun at a very high RPM. And the centrifugal force is going this way. And so the, the, depending on the density of the different um, uh, components in that solution, for example, um, you know, blood cells obviously have a higher density than just the liquid around it, so the blood cells would sediment to the bottom like this. Okay, so this is an example of a separation. So again, I'm, I'm uh, getting back to the question why separations are important. Well, we want to analyze it. This is we want to analyze the different types of particles. So that's a motivation for particle separations, and then we also want to be able to analyze molecules. So in this plasma portion of it, there aren't any particles, but there are molecules. There are many different types of proteins. There are many different types of antibodies. All these tiny molecules that have an immense importance in the function of our uh, of our bodies. So uh, blood tests are obviously used in you know many different types of uh, uh, diagnostics, disease diagnostics. So we want to have a way of, uh, um, first of all, separating the solid particulates from the plasma. But once we have the plasma, we also want to separate the contents of the plasma. So the plasma contains thousands of proteins and metabolites and, and other components as well. We want to measure the concentration of each one of these proteins or each one of these metabolites. So we have to separate them out first. We have to separate protein A from protein B from protein C. And then we can individually analyze you know, how much of protein A, B, and C we have. So that's where molecular separations become important, separating individual molecules in a solution. And molecu uh, molecular separations, you can separate molecules based on uh, size, based on charge, based on biochemical affinities, or other properties. So uh, separations is, is pretty much a, a, a core technology in any type of um, uh, biological or chemical analysis. So as an outline of this uh, module, we're going to talk about molecular separations first and the interaction of molecules with, with flow. We'll talk about a device that separates molecules based, just based on diffusion, something called the H filter. Uh, the separation of molecules based on their electrophoretic mobilities, in other words, the size and the charge of the molecule. And that's electrophoresis. That's been a very commercially successful uh, part of microfluidics. Uh, we'll talk about isoelectric focusing and gel-based separations. These are all methods to separate molecules based on their size and charge and um, in something called an isoelectric point. So this type of these three techniques are used um, in, in all life sciences and pharmaceutical type laboratories. Then we'll talk about uh, chromatography. Chromatography is, um, uh, it, it doesn't use electric fields. It separates molecules based on how quickly they move through uh, a packed capillary bed. So that'll make sense more when I talk to it. And that, that allows you to separate um, a mixture of proteins by, uh, a mixture of not just proteins, but any type of molecules based on um, their size, their charge, and other properties. Then we'll end up talking about molecular sieving. So we're going to, you know, some of the stuff, concepts we're going to talk about are concepts that have been used since, you know, it's used for decades. So they were like, you know, conventional, like macro scale devices. But more recently, they've been miniaturized over the last 20 years. They've been miniaturized into uh, 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 lab on a chip type systems. So we're going to combine both of those discussions together because you need to know some of the basic concepts before we, you know, to understand how the lab and chip devices work. The second half of this module is going to be on uh, particle separations. And we're going to talk about how particles interact with, with flow. So particle separations, I gave you a motivation for that on the previous slide. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in how you can uh, focus particles to a certain area of the channel how you can do field flow fractionation, which is basically a way to separate particles by size, a deterministic lateral displacement, inertial separators. These are all methods which can separate uh, particles and sort particles by size. Imagine if you, if you want to have a system where particles of one size go out into one outlet and particles of a different size go into a different outlet. In the case of blood analysis, you, know, you can do a red blood cell count. You can do a white blood cell count. Or if you're if you're doing some type of environmental analysis, you can you have a you want to count how many bacteria of a certain size are in uh, um, you know, 
in the water. Like you have pond water, right? There's there's a classification that I actually learned about recently where the, um, the, the state, the Great Lakes Protection folks want to know how many bacteria do we have between 0 to 10 micrometers? How many bacteria do we have between 10 to 100 micrometers? And how many um, bacteria or microorganisms do we have greater than 100 micrometers? So if you can actually separate particles by size, then you have ways of they have ways to do those types of uh, uh, specific, ac uh, um, precise analytics. So then we'll also talk about uh, uh, you know dielectrophoresis uh, methods of uh, doing particle separations, gravity based, magnetic based, and we'll start talking about cell and particle traps. So let's begin with the molecular separations, and we'll do this. I guess we only have about a half an hour left today, but let's see how much of this we can get through. So the first type of um, the first type of device, it uses something called an H filter, and the reason why I'm bringing up the H filter right now is. Uh, uh, let me just turn The reason I'm talking about the H filter first because I think it relates very well to the homework problem that you all had uh, that you turned in last week. <clears throat> so this is where you remember you just had uh, two inlets and those two inlets met together in a laminar flow channel and then there was two outlets at, at the outside. Okay. Uh, now in that experiment or in that uh, simulation you looked at what would happen if you had a high concentration of oxygen here and no concentration of oxygen here. Right? We, we know that the oxygen would diffuse from high concentration stream to low concentration stream. Right? Now, and this can actually be used to separate molecules because two different molecules may diffuse at different rates. And so the concept is here that um, um, you know, the basic rule of thumb is this. Small molecules diffuse faster than larger molecules. So if you have a mixture of a small and large molecule uh, coming in through this one inlet, uh, these laminar streams will meet, and then you have these two outlets here. The small molecules, the blue ones, will diffuse more rapidly into the upper stream than the larger molecules. And the laminar flow system can be designed in a way such that only the small molecules have the time to diffuse to the upper stream and so this stream will contain a purified mixture of the uh, of just the small uh, molecules, and this one this stream will contain um, a mixture of the large molecules as well as the small molecules, because some of the small molecules w didn't have the opportunity to diffuse up there. Okay, this uh, the H filter would be designed in a way such that there's the the time of interaction. Um, is relatively small, right? So only the small molecules would be able to get up there. So, you know, it turns out that this is a this is a nice system uh, because it's, it's a very well understood system, right? You did a simulation on that in your homework. Um, the concepts of diffusion are very well understood. Uh, this is a molecular diffusion slide I showed you all earlier. A fixed law of diffusion, the first and second laws of diffusion describe um, the the diffusion of molecules from high to low concentration. The diffusion rate J is equal to the diffusion coefficient times the concentration gradient. All right, so we know that molecules will move from high concentration to low concentration and it's all governed by this this equation here, the diffusion length, the average distance the molecule is diffused after a given time T is the square root of 2 times diffusion coefficient times time. Now this diffusion coefficient is given by the Stokes-Einstein relation. And this is the key here. Different, um, I mentioned, smaller molecules diffuse faster. RP is the molecule radius here. It appears in the denominator. Now, finding the specific diffusion coefficient for a certain molecule is something that actually has to be measured. But if you just want to get a rough estimate of the diffusion coefficient of a molecule, you can use the Stokes-Einstein relation. And this is just based on the size of the molecule. Okay, you have kT on the top. On the bottom, you have 6 pi times the viscosity times the molecule radius. All right, so 
small molecules will have a, a larger diffusion coefficient. They will diffuse uh, faster. So these are a few examples of uh, diffusion coefficients. Um, the molecular weight, you know, the molecular, the size of the molecule, the radius of the molecule depends on its molecular weight, right? Molecular, high molecular weight means it'll be a larger molecule. So you can see that as the uh, um, as the molecular weight goes down, so the, the smallest molecules are at the top of this chart, the diffusion coefficient uh, goes up. So if you have two molecules here that have very different diffusion coefficients, then you can use the H filter to, to separate them in a very simple laminar flow device. So the size selectivity here can be tuned by selecting the flow rates. It can also be tuned by choosing the fluid viscosity because the fluid viscosity also determines the diffusion coefficient. So they have used this H filter system to separate proteins and plasma components from cells. Okay, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to do um, uh, separations. Now, you know, one of the downsides with this, of course, is you can see that in the... Oh, One of the downsides with this, of course, is you can see that this is, um, you know, this outlet is not purified, not completely purified. But you could imagine that if you cascaded several H filters together, you know, and, and in each one of those H filters you're pulling out some of these blue, um, some of the smaller molecules, you can cascade this idea and, and get um, better quality separation. All right, but you're never going to get 100% pure sample here. And in, it's difficult to get 100% pure sample on this side as well. Just because like some of these, you know, you'll have a small number of molecules that do end up diffusing over. That's a dumb question. If you had both those loops recirculated, would you eventually have them separated? If they're re recirculated? So if each of those loops were recirculated, would you eventually have a separate set of additional filters Now, what, what would that look like if you had them recirculate? Maybe, maybe you could uh, draw it and grab a chalk thing. Or we could just, you know, we could just draw it, draw it on this thing here. Just, uh, yeah, here we go. So this would keep going around like this, and this one would keep going around like this. Oh, if it was recirculating. In that loop. Would, that, hmm. would they separate? That's, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, the two things would, um, so you're saying to have like a, a, a laminar system where the, the middle is interacting, but they they just keep on recirculating back through there. So you started off with a high concentration over here and almost uh, mm -hmm. distilled water. Just as, would you eventually get the separation of those? It, I, think, I think that would work. Yeah, I think that would actually work. Um, yeah, inter interesting idea. And it's, it's a little bit difficult to implement these types of uh, um, uh, these types of recirculating uh, channels or circular channels in microfluidics. I mean, you can make a circular channel, but then you also have to have a way of pumping fluids through there. The reason why they use um, a channel like this is because you can obviously you can have you know a pump here and a pump here, and easily you know pump liquids through the channel. If you were to have a recirculating device, it's, it's a good idea actually. Um, you just have to have like a peristaltic pump here. So, for example, you have three, you know, you have three diaphragms there that can pump liquids you know, through the through the channel like this. It'd be an interesting problem to, to look at. Yeah, I know you're interested in um, uh, desalination, right? That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, would you eventually get a high salt concentration on one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, you know, uh, at the last microtest conference I went to, there was there's some folks doing, interested in using, uh, doing desalination within laminar flows within microfluidic channels, but they were uh, they were taking advantage of electric fields. You know, by by applying an electric field orthogonally to the channel, they were getting the ions to kind of you know go off in certain directions. Um, you know, I wonder if you could do something just on the basis of diffusion. It'd be interesting things to to, to look at. But, the, you know, sodium and chloride, 
they're small molecules, so they have very fast diffusion coefficients. So you have to make sure that the length of interaction was relatively small. Yeah. Interesting idea. Uh, let's see, here. moving on. Uh, this is not a separate device, uh, but it's, it's a sensor that's based on the H-filter. Um, it allows you to measure the uh, um, both analyte concentrations. More importantly, it allows you to measure the, uh, the diffusion coefficients of molecules. Okay, the, the basic idea here is, like I was saying, that um, you know, how much a molecule diffuses from one stream to the other is basically determined by its diffusion coefficient. So the T sensor was basically a device where um, you know they had this uh, laminar flow region. They assumed that the analyte M is in the, at, at a certain concentration. You have a step concentration profile from one side of the channel to the other. And by looking at how much it diffuses from one side to the other, um, but just by taking a picture of it, you can uh, get an idea of what the diffusion coefficient is. And so they actually measured the uh, diffusion coefficients of a bunch of different fluorescent uh, molecules uh, molecules here. And they correlated that with the molecular weights, and they found that it, it lines up really well. This was uh, one of the earlier papers this was back in 2001, but it nicely illustrates both laminar flows and how the diffusion coefficient depends on um, how, how it can be used to measure diffusion coefficients. So getting back to the uh, electrical double layer. Now, the reason we're talking about the electrical double layer in the context of chemical separations is because in uh, electrophoresis, in capillary electrophoresis, a technique that's used to separate uh, molecules by charge and size, uh, the electrical double layer and electroosmotic flow play a very important role. So um, let me just go over that again real quick. Um, it, it, the Debye layer can be used to uh, pump uh, fluids through, an through a channel by using an electric field. You have to use a surface that, that acquires charge when it's wetted with liquid. So something like glass or silicon will become negatively charged when the channel is filled with, with water, let's say. Okay, and a lot of the analytes that we analyze are, are aqueous, so that's a safe assumption. Suppose that the, uh, the wall of the channel gets a negative charge. Uh, in, the, in the liquid, there's ions. There's positive and negative ions, but those positive ions, they actually line up near the surface here, forming something called the stern layer, and that's an immobile layer. Next to the stern layer, there's a diffuse layer where there's, a, there's still a high concentration of positive ions um, compared to negative ions, and that can be used for, for pumping effects. We'll get to that in the next slide. But um, you know the, the, this electrical double layer slide is, is showing that the counter ions, the positively charged ions in this case, counter ions are defined as the ones that are have the opposite polarity compared to what is on the solid surface. So the solid surface is negative, the counter ions are positive, the co-ions are negative. Counter ion concentration goes up rapidly near the walls of, of the channel and it drops exponentially as we go further away. You notice that this charge density, Q of Y, it's the inverse exponential function of Y. So it just drops exponentially uh, as we go away from the channel. Um, the rate at which it drops off, or you know, you, another way you could think about it is that roughly the width of this, this region here, where you, have this, uh, uh, where you have this changing concentration and you have uh, a change in the electrical potential, that's called the, uh, the Debye length. And that's a well understood uh, uh, formula for that. Epsilon kT in the numerator, this is, there's, this is a square root term. Um, epsilon is the dielectric constant, uh, kT is the Boltzmann constant and the temperature. Um, e squared, so E is the electron charge, it's a, it's a constant. And then this part here depends on the ions that you have in the, um, in the liquid. So for each ion that you have, for example, we, t we mentioned sodium chloride, you know, you'd have Na plus ions and you'd have Cl negative ions. There's two ionic species in there. So for each one of those ionic species, you have to, you know, you have to include one thing for the summation. It will become one of the summation terms. So 
the, the, the valence number for sodium will be plus 1. And then you put in the concentration of the sodium. And that becomes one term. The next term is the, the, the valence number of the concentration for the chloride ions. All right, so basically, you know, we find that, that the, um, you know, the, more, uh, uh, the more ion concentration you have in the solution, the shorter your Debye length is going to be. The more charges you have in the solution, the more charges you have on the wall, that's also going to increase your zeta potential. So the more zeta potential you have, the more ability you have to do electroosmotic, uh, electroosmotic flow or electroosmotic pumping. So electroosmotic flow, you know, you can see that uh, as we talked about in the last module, again, I'll just mention briefly again, is that uh, as a result of this electrical double error, this negative charge is on the surface of the solid. Then in, in the liquid itself, you have a buildup of positive charge here. Right next, to wall, right next to the wall, those charges are immobile because at the wall, the flow velocity is always zero. So those charges right at the wall are not moving. But right next to it, there's a diffuse layer, and uh, these charges can move. There's a large number of positive charges here, fewer negative charges. So when you apply a positive voltage from one side of the channel to the other over the length of the channel, these positive charges will move from left to right. That's electroosmotic flow. It uh, depends on the applied electric field, depends on the cross-sectional dimensions of the channel, the surface charge density, which determines the zeta potential, and it also depends on the, the fluid itself, the ion density and the pH of the working fluid. So when we use electroosmotic flow in, in microfluidic chips for separations, we have to be careful about what the ion densities are, what the contents of the sample is. All right, so that's an optimization step that has to be done. Uh, so the electroosmotic flow velocity, it scales with the applied voltage, also scales with the, uh, um, the zeta potential, inversely proportional to the viscosity of the liquid. And in a cylindrical capillary, remember these two terms here, one term scales as a to the fourth, and the other one term says scales as a to the a squared. The pressure-driven term scales as a to the fourth, and uh, uh, the electroosmotic flow term scales as a squared. So if you have a small cylindrical capillary, this term, the second term, becomes more significant. The electroosmotic flow term becomes more significant than the pressure-driven flow term. This is key. So if you want electroosmotic flow, you should be using a small uh, capillary. And in fact, a lot of the capillaries that are used for electroosmotic flow and chemical separations is typically on the order of um, 25, 10 to 25 micrometers all the way up to maybe a couple hundred micrometers. Okay. Beyond that, you know, the pressure-driven flow starts to become more significant. Electroosmosis just doesn't work anymore. All right, so you know, I went through this relatively quickly. If you want to go back to the previous lecture on pumps, you can uh, um, look more closely at that. So let's talk about electrophoresis now. <clears throat> so electrophoresis is a way to separate molecules based on, uh, based on their size and their charge. So each type of molecule has something called an electrophoretic mobility. So we'll get to that in a second. So, uh, but before we talk about separations based on electrophoresis, let's talk about this electrophoresis mechanism itself. If you take a molecule or a particle and you place it in an electric field, that molecule may move due to Coulombic forces. Coulombic forces meaning like, you know, um, positive charges move in the same direction as the electric field, negative charges move opposite the electric field. It's that experiment from physics, you know, where you create an electric field by applying a voltage on two sides of a capacitor. Positive charges build up here negative charges build up here. The electric field is um, pointed from positive to negative charge. If I were to take a positive charge here, okay, that positive charge would get accelerated down this way. If I were to put a negative charge here, 
negative charge would be accelerated that way. Because like charges repel like. So the positive charge is moving away from the positive towards the negative. Negative charge is moving away from the negative towards the positive. So notice in terms of the electric field, positive charges move in the same direction as the electric field. The negative charges move opposite the electric field. So let me just give you two formulas here. The electric field is equal to voltage divided by the distance. This is the distance between the two plates. And force is equal to the electric field times the charge Q. So if this has a charge Q on it, the force exerted on the particle by the electric field is just force is equal to the electric field times Q. So this is a very basic concept from physics. Now, we know that there's going to be a force. So if you have a force, I'm sorry, if you have a particle or a molecule in an electric field and that, in a, and that molecule or particle happens to be charged, it's going to be subjected to this electric force, or Coulombic force. How fast it moves in response to that force is the electro, uh, electrophoretic mobility. So if the molecule or the particle is in fluid, the Coulombic force is balanced by the drag force due to the viscosity of the surrounding fluid. If you have a particle that's in vacuum, that thing's going to move very rapidly, right? Because there's nothing there to stop it. But if, you, if, it's, in, if it's in a very viscous medium like, like syrup, it's going to move slowly, right? Because the viscosity of the medium is, um, is larger. So the velocity depends on the electrophoretic, the electric field and the electrophoretic mobility, mu. So the velocity of uh, the velocity of the molecule or the, or the particle, vi, is equal to the electrophoretic mobility times the electric field. So for small molecules, the electrophoretic mobility depends on the particle's size and charge. So the ue, mu e is equal to the, uh, uh, the ion valence number. So that'll be, again, if you have sodium ion, that'll be plus 1. Multiplied by uh, uh, this constant Q, electronic, electron charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, divided by 6 pi ri, the radius of the ion, multiplied by the viscosity, the viscosity of whatever fluid you're in. So if, if, the, uh, if the ion is in water, it's the viscosity of water. All right, so let's look at the intuition behind this. The velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. So the mobility depends on, mobility is how fast it moves, depends on the, the amount of charge in the numerator, and it inversely depends on the size of the molecule. So smaller molecules will move faster in the presence of the electric field because there's less resistance, there's less drag. You can think about it that way. So this gives us a way to separate molecules based on, uh, based on size and charge. Suppose you had a whole bunch of molecules that were lined up in one place, and then you applied an electric field. This, the, the molecules that are small and highly charged, which have a high electrophoretic mobility, they're going to move very rapidly. And the molecules that are larger and have less charge, they're going to move more slowly. So if, if, if it was a foot race, literally, the the small, highly charged molecules will move faster. That's what electrophoretic separations is based on. You apply an electric field, and the different molecules move at different speeds. Now, this uh, concept can also be applied to particles. Um, so for particles, th there's a, a bit of a, a complication in that the electrical double layer around the particle plays a role. Remember, there's, there could be an electrical double layer on the surface of the particle. So as a result, the electrophoretic mobility depends on the particle's diffusion coefficient as well as its zeta potential. So you can see that the mobility depends on the zeta potential here on the top. 
So the more charges it acquires, you know, the, the faster it's going to respond to the electric field, the more charged the particle is. So that will end up um, making the molecule move faster. D is a diffusion coefficient, and the diffusion coefficient you can was defined up here earlier by the Stokes-Einstein relation. And um, the denominator here is 4 pi times mu. Again, the, the viscosity of the medium uh, appears in the denominator. Okay, so molecules and particles have different electrophoretic mobilities based on their size and charge. So these are all the different electrophoresis uh, techniques, or at least the most popular ones. Uh, there's agarose gel electrophoresis, um, SDS, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, isoelectric focusing. These are based in a gel. Uh, this is where um, instead of a liquid, the, well, the, the, uh, the molecules are moving through a hydrogel. So we'll, talk about, we'll talk about these a little bit later. Uh, you can also uh, talk about the capillary techniques. The capillary techniques are, include capillary zone electrophoresis, capillary gel electrophoresis, capillary isoelectric um, focusing, and then these types of electrochromatography techniques. Uh, we'll, we'll talk, we're coming up just at the end of the hour, or end of the class period right now, so um, we'll start talking about a few of these techniques. We'll focus, next time in class, we'll focus on uh, capillary zone electrophoresis. We'll talk a little bit about gel electrophoresis. Um, and we'll talk about how those can be miniaturized into uh, microfluidic systems. Um, what's the best way to do this? Yeah, I think we're coming up with just at the end of the hour today. So let's, um, let's end here today. And uh, next time in class on Wednesday, we'll jump right into... Um, electrophoresis, uh, capillary electrophoresis techniques, and how they're miniaturized to lab on a chip systems. Oh, there we go.